This is awesome. I leave the studio where I have to sit next to Chuck Wicks and I come in here with Mark from Midland instead. So just like another reminder about my failed modeling career. <laughs> Uh, dude, what we're doing, we're trying to kind of get to know. You're Midland. a beautiful man. Thank you. Start by saying that. Inside and inside. <laughs> um, <laughs> we uh, the goal has kind of been to to introduce you know our our listeners and the people that hang out on social media with us and stuff to who you guys are more on like the personal level. Yeah. Uh, because you know the music obviously speaks for itself. As a group, you get a lot of time to chat on the radio as the group. But yeah. One on one, it's kind of cool to get to know you guys. Like, what's your history? It's like? rare. Yeah, it's cool. I feel like when uh, when you first came in, it's probably a couple years ago, since I got here anyway. Uh, were you clean shaven for a while? Yeah, you know, I I, I always uh, I always change it up. I get bored, okay. and I like to, I'm kind of like a chameleon. So, uh, yeah, like like anything in life, I like to experience it kind of different ways. I'm, some guys will just stick with the same look their entire life. Like my dad, my dad was a was a marine lieutenant colonel. And, He's always high and tight. He's got the same mustache that he got in Vietnam, and he hasn't changed a thing. Wow. I'll change from from week to week, you know. Where'd you, yeah, where'd you grow up? I look, I look like a, I look young. No, it's funny because I, I always think like, yeah, you like two years went by, and all of a sudden, uh, I was like, Bradley Cooper just walked in here. Uh, <laughs> it, no, it's just interesting because you did. You looked super young, like yeah, sixteen. You know, what happens is you just get on the road, and, and with our schedules, the last thing you're thinking about is kind of a. Uh, is uh, his personal appearance. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is uh, is take the time or the effort to, to shave. So usually this is just guided by uh, my my level of, of energy and usually guided by laziness. I can't take it like it's, it's not so a fashion thing. statement. Does it buggy every once in a while or no? I just don't. Like uh, you it. know, I like uh, I like doing the extremities. I like just to let it grow, grow, and uh, and grow the whole beard, and then uh, I like just to go straight. You know, Sam Elliott mustache and. Every once in a while, when I'm feeling really haggard and tired from the road, I like to uh, shave it and see if I, I still look somewhat young. Yeah, I if I feel a little bit young. I kind of well, I kind of brought that up because I was talking to I think I asked Jess about it, but I was trying to figure out what it was about Midland that like really sets you guys apart. And I think style always comes into the conversation as one thing, but this is more me asking you on a personal level. I think I was listening to Burnout. You guys were singing Burnout, and I was yeah. like, dang, those harmonies are like ridiculous. So do you think when it comes to like what I call the X factor of Midland, is it is it those harmonies? Is it the lyric in the song? Is it the style? I think uh, I, I think it's it's kind of like the, the holy trio. I think for me, music and, and for us as musicians and artists that we admire and really have based our sound off, uh, have all three of these. They're songwriters, one, they're recording artists, the artists that know how to uh, take a demo that you're, you're writing in a room, usually with acoustic guitars, and then you take that little sketch and you go to the studio. Mm. And the I artists, see a lot of songs die in that stage. Yeah, but that's I mean that's so important, and a lot of artists um, don't even have anything to do with that. You know, we're involved in all the production and, and everything, so we write. And then we're able to go in and collaborate with our producers and, and produce with ourselves um, and realize the full potential of a demo. That's two. Three is to go out and and do it live and play it live and to entertain. You know, we're, we're entertainers and I think it's those three things that really, I think, set us, set us apart. And, the influences, you know, there's, you know, Nashville is now incredibly diverse and, and people have all kinds of influences. What works for us is that we have such an overlapping influence. I think as songwriters, uh, the types of songs that we're singing, there's a lot of Eagles influence in the arrangements because we love the harmonies, Alabama, the band, you know, Levon and, and, and Robbie Robertson and all those guys, the harmonies that they would do were unbelievable. Um, and then you know, that songwriting sensibility, you know, you've got that Dean Dillon, that early George Strait, the Gary Stewart, the, uh, that George Jones, Conway Twitty, we were able to really uh, imbue these songs with, with a lot of heartbreak and soul and, and sing about things that are real. Mm -hmm. And then also in the, the next page, jump into a song like Mr. Lonely that's irreverent and that's just fun. You know, the song is meant to, to kind of pick you up and uh and and whisk you away to the dance floor and just have fun you know and that's all part of 
I guess what our what our influences are, and it's part of what what our live show is. What's your like? What's your early influences? What's your family actually? You know, growing up, what was your house? Yeah, what, what so people were in it. I'm the youngest of, of six kids, um, Catholic. I I took that as a dad. I don't know. <laughs> like I have two kids, and I'm like, how do people do this? And six. My mother is is an absolute saint. Um, I have a twin brother. We were a, a 40 year old mistake uh, or blessing. Yeah. Surprise. Uh, we grew up uh we grew up on a cattle ranch um in a beautiful place called rain valley arizona it's about an hour and a half south of tucson and i grew up on on my grandfather's ranch the ranch that my mother was raised on um rain valley ranch and um we uh we were pretty wild and free you know we didn't lock our doors um we grew up working you know it was uh um, when i was a kid it was an eighteen thousand acre operation you know, a couple thousand head. Um, so we were up early. We were we had to do chores. We always had to work, and that was the nature. That was the serenity. And, and when we were out there working, you know, my mom would be often alone. My sisters were older, so before we started school, um, my mom needed help feeding the cattle. So she taught us at age five how to drive a stick shift and how to drive the truck while she was throwing bales of hay yeah. or you know uh, breeder cube, you know, uh, food for the cattle out. And there was always country radio was on. My mom is the one that really turned me on to country music, and she was always singing when we were out riding after school. We'd, we'd get dropped off of the bus. My mom would be waiting for the two horses for me and my brother. During breeding season um, or calving season, we'd be out riding, and my mom would sing. And um, ironically, or I guess serendipitously, my dad, when, when they moved back out to the ranch in 77, my dad was a Marine fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. My sisters wow. were all born in Southern California. My dad made a promise to my mom after 20 years of touring um, and being in the military, they'd move home and take over the family ranch. So what they did. My dad's- Were they based in San Diego? They were in Orange County, um, in uh, El Toro. Yeah, wow. Which is basically San Juan, Capistrano, uh, Laguna Beach, that area. In between LA and San Diego. That's right. And uh, my dad is a city kid. My dad was born in, uh, in Poland, immigrated in 1950, and grew up in Compton in Los Angeles. So my dad grew up on on bebop, on R&B, on the blues, rock and roll. But uh, they bought a live country music honky-tonk, a little bar about 12 miles from the ranch in a little town called Sonoida. And uh, this was the only show in town. Uh, in the 80s, it was rock and roll, honky-tonk, country music, um, country and western on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it was a, a little bit of a blend of all of it. So you had the band playing Don Williams, Waylon Jennings, George Jones, doing Conway, um, you know, uh, Johnny Cash stuff, and then playing Dire Straits, playing the Rolling Stones, playing the Beatles, playing Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty songs, um, you know, so I, and, and then, you know, doing Ray, throwing Ray Charles, that was my first ever album. You know, I got uh, Modern Sounds of Country Music. And for me, it's always been a blend of the soul and R&B and blues and country and rock and roll. To me, the, 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 the line, the common thread through all those, the artists that I love in country music, rock and roll, R&B, they all are soul singers. And I think they approach it as, as soul uh, writers and artists. And there's this sincerity and this, this authenticity to what they're singing about. Yeah. That's always just captured my interest. I'm not, I'm not interested in pop. I'm not interested in, in something that doesn't really come from an authentic experience, you know what I mean? And you can say, oh, well, what about Mr. Lonely? Well, Mr. Lonely comes from an authentic experience of, of growing up in a dance hall, you know, and hearing, you know, those fast as you, or, you know, George Strait, the fireman, yeah. um, or Brooks and Dunn, you know, Boots, Coot and Boogie, those songs that are just about having fun, they're a little bit bravado, but are, they serve a purpose of getting people out just to go and dance. And then you slow him up with, you know, he stopped loving her today or something. And you stop everybody in their tracks or, you know, uh, something did, like Poncho. Did you know if your family get to come? Because the other, so the other night you guys did a, a show at the Ryman. Yeah. And to me, that, that to me, if I had the talent that y'all have, is the epitome of what I would want to do. I would, I would want to be on that stage. Was anybody else from your family there? Yeah. Uh, my, my mom and dad were there. Um, my, my twin brother was there. And and my my partner my my girlfriend Tyler was there along with her her mom and her mom has a twin sister too so there's kind of a twin connection um, and uh, 
growing up, my, my mom grew up actually listening to the Grand Ole Opry when it was at the Ryman. Yeah. But my parents are, are a bit older, like I said. My mom wept when she heard in 53 when, when Hank died. She was listening. She, she was, heard it from, uh, they, from the show. They pulled into the ranch where I also grew up in 53 and they announced that Hank Williams had died. And my mom and my aunts, her little sisters, all wept. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was a big deal. So there is this reverence for, for, for music, really, in my family. Um, and my family has supported me in all of my crazy endeavors. You know, I've never really uh, chased the your, your typical uh, career or life path. I've always kind of been about the experience. They didn't ever expect you to be in IT? No, definitely. They never. They always knew that I was never going to be working in an office or doing that. I've, I've always just, uh, I've chased creativity and I've chased uh, adventure. Yeah. And uh, to have them there at the Ryman, to me, the playing the Ryman was the most important show um, of my career, and and the hardest show of my career because you feel the weight of of all the legends and all the spirits that are. You just, you know, the first time when I was. 15, 16 years ago, I came to Nashville and, and saw the Ryman the first time I wept openly. I came in there. You know, when I saw Marty Robbins suits sitting there, I just, you know, I, I pictured me getting on, on the stage with the band when I was 19 and singing El Paso and and seeing Johnny Cash in June Carter's room and, you know, doing Folsom Prison or doing um, Long Black Veil with my mom on Christmas Eve, you know. I uh, heard doing the June June Carter harmonies and all this comes washing back into you and it makes you realize it's hard not even to get teary eyed uh, right now. It just um, it makes you realize how important music is and it's uh, and it's completely shaped my life and it and it uh, for better or for worse you know it's big it can be tough too you know the road is the road is tough and a lot of my heroes um, weren't the best role models you know so it is a it is a precarious uh, career path and, and, and way to make a living but when you step on the stage at the Ryman uh, I wouldn't trade anything I wouldn't trade any of the hardships I wouldn't I wouldn't trade any of it uh, I would do it for free yeah um, and that I think it cost you four hundred dollars I think I it did I think I lost four hundred cash but I'll never forget uh, having the opportunity you cash in the dressing room right I'll never forget the opportunity to get to thank my mom and my dad in front of the entire audience and That's my awesome. brother and my girlfriend. And, uh, and what cool validation is you had, you had a lot of people pop up there that didn't have to, I'm sure, and they chose to and that. Well, we, we had, the craziest thing is we had our friends, uh, you know, and now I can I can actually say that they're, they're friends of ours and collaborators, you know, um, uh, Kix Brooks and, and Ronnie Dunn reached out to us and, and said, uh, you know, we'd really like to come out and do Boot Scootin'. Which um, you guys did on the on the reboot album. Which we collaborated and did a, our own Midland version, which is a two and a half step down, by the way. Because I didn't, <laughs> Ronnie. I didn't know if that was for me. I I told Ronnie. I said, Ronnie, is it okay if we tune this half step down? Because I don't want to, I don't want to do a Ronnie Dunn impersonation. Uh, because I, since I can remember singing, I was singing that song. I was singing Neon Moon. Uh, you know, I. Is so, Neon, Moon, Neon Moon is the one you guys did. No, we did Boots Good. Okay, I thought so. But uh, Neon Moon. Neon is, Moon was Casey. Casey Musgraves, Musgraves did that one. Yeah. Um, Neon Moon is perhaps one of my all-time favorite songs. Period. I yeah, love absolutely. it. And and Boots Good and Boogie is is become one of my favorite ones to sing. And so Brooks and Dunn came out for the encore, and I'm sitting there singing with Ronnie, and Ronnie's looking at me. You're singing with Ronnie Dunn at the and, and Kicks is looking at me, and I'm moving between the two of them. And you know, I knew that my mom was out there. My mom's the biggest country music fan. She watches countdown she listens to the countdown she listens to kicks she listens to bob kingsley's countdown and you know she really is uh she taught me everything about country music awesome. and uh and that was so special and then of course to have chris isaac who i remember being 10 or 11 years old and seeing the wicked game music wicked video game. that her brits directed and, and helena christensen started and, and i remember looking at that my brother and i going Oh, I want, I want to be like this guy. That's cool. Yeah. This is who I'm going to model my life after. And, uh, you know, Chris Isaac was a massive, massive influence on us as well, who has his own kind of West Coast dreamy uh, California country thing going on that he doesn't get a lot of credit for. And to have Chris and get to do Wicked Game, who 
that was perhaps one of the real first songs I learned to master. And that's how I learned to do- You can sing that. Bar baritone yes. to full voice falsetto wow. um, and, and do my range all the way from there. I really, I was, I said, like, Marty Robbins can do El Paso and Chris Isaac can do Wicked Game and I, Elvis can do that. Those are like the big guys that I was like, I need to be able to do that, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was, it was, it was really like a dream and, and just really getting to reflect back on it now. I'm allowed to let the emotion wash in because on stage I had to push a lot of that out so I just didn't become a, a whimpering mess. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> I, cool, was, man. I was close to it, but it's so much fun and, and getting to do this with your best friends, with Jess and Cameron, and now we have such an affinity with Luke Cutchin, our lead guitarist, who's been with us since the beginning. And Robbie Crowell is such an amazing player. The band is, is continuing to grow. The music is evolving. We're getting better and better, which is you know, which is uh, a result of just touring and playing all the time, which is a result of people digging what we're doing. Yeah. And what we're doing is just making music that that means something to us, that is authentic to us, and. Um, and that's the best thing, you know, we're, we're doing, we're making it work um, and the fans are digging it with us just doing what we're doing. Nobody's, nobody's changed us. Nobody's asked us to change. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a great label and, and producing partners that have just helped us, again, realize our full potential sonically and, and guide us with that sound, which is, it's fun. And the rhyme was just a validation for us. That's awesome. This is Mark of Midland. Make Thank sure you're you downloading guys. on Apple Music. <laughs> Allergies. <laughs> Let's go shave, dude.